Welcome to the Executive Innovation Show podcast, where we bring you real executive conversations with industry game changers and thought leaders. We ask the questions you're thinking, what you're scared to ask, and we make your brain hurt afterward. With your host, Carrie Chitsy Wells, co founder and CEO of One Touch Video Chat, live video interviews, and the nonprofit Humans Helping Humans. Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's podcast. We're going to be talking about is the EHR helping or hurting doctors' productivity? Today, I have a great guest with me on the show. I've got Dr. Mark Wiseman, who is the Chief Medical Information Officer for Peninsula Regional Medical Center in Maryland. He's also a board-certified internal medicine physician who has practiced in inpatient ambulatory care in hospitals and high-volume clinics. Dr. Wiseman, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks, Carrie. Thanks for having me on. Well, great. I want to talk about the EHR and really tie it back to this crazy, good, bad, awesome article in Fortune recently. Uh, And we'll get to that in a second. But I want to talk about the doctor side of EHR. Before you became the chief medical information officer, you were the, you know, a physician. So I want you to put that physician hat back on for a second and let's talk real about what is doctors' perspectives of the EHR and really its value to patients. I know it's added a lot of work. I know there's kind of both sides of this coin, but what are you really hearing from the doctor point of view? You're right. There's there's the good and the bad. Uh, let's go back about 10 years or so, which is about when I started on the uh, on the EHR. And, and that's when the government incentives came out and everyone was told, you know, the government's going to give you some extra money if you go on this EHR. If you don't, you're going to get penalized in a few years. So get moving. And I, we all we all looked at the demos and said, oh, this is a great tool and the very slick sales presentations. And we all bought into it and said, oh, it's fantastic. And then when we went live, we kind of kind of saw that it wasn't quite what they sold us because when they did the sales demos, all the data was in there and they had these pre-canned patients that you, they knew exactly what they needed to say and do to make the EHR work the way they wanted it to. Yes. Now, in real life comes along that patients aren't so neat and easy. They're very complex and we have no data in the computer systems. So for the first two to three months, your head's down, like typing in the chart and my patients, they started to complain. I mean, I, I had top-notch patient experience scores. And then I started looking at the surveys and I'm getting, you know, the doctor seemed detached today. This was an impersonal visit. I mean, the patients were feeling it. And this was throughout the organization that the, when we went live on that EHR, the patients knew it. And some of them gave us a little leeway and they forgave us. Most of us said, oh my goodness, we need to figure out how to master this tool very quickly. Some of my colleagues never got there. They, they felt a loss of control when they went on. You know, the EHR is telling them how to practice. Um, they weren't very comfortable with the technology and they didn't feel comfortable asking for help because the doctor's always been perceived as being, you know, they're top, they're, they know everything. Um, so they didn't feel like asking for help because they didn't want to look stupid. And I think that, that hurt some of them. And they definitely lost time, definitely had more work shifted to them, things that their secretaries or nurses used to do suddenly are or, or they're being asked to click and, and do it themselves. And the patients probably felt that as the doctor felt rushed as they tried to do that. For those of us who really dug in, made it work, the productivity eventually returned to normal. I think the patient uh, complaints, you know, they, they just decreased. They went away. We got better. Um, and we started to engage our patients with the tool, we put you know the computer screen up on the wall, and we would point at saying, "Hey, here's your cholesterol values over time. Look at this. Let's graph them." And the patients really liked that because that we couldn't really do as well on paper. We could now show them their you know their their diabetic scores over time. The other neat thing that really started to happen behind the scenes, the patients didn't see this, is that we could start caring for them when they weren't in front of us in the office. Right. Uh, normally, I wouldn't know if your mammogram was due or your colonoscopy was due until you were in front of me and I had the chart in front of me and I was looking at it. Now I could just run a report and say, hey, computer, tell me all my patients that are due for a colonoscopy. Hand that off to my nurse and say, go get them. Go hunt them down. Let's, let's get this done. The patients were getting that preventative care. They didn't even realize it, but it was now happening behind the scenes. And that was a lot of value, um, a lot of value to the providers and to the patients. They just didn't see it. Yeah, and I think that would 
<clears throat> that really adds a lot of value, especially when you're talking about, you know, chronic care and things like that, where some of that stuff is, is critical. But I want to get back to something you said about, you know, the doctor time. So the recent article that came out in Fortune magazine, the death by a thousand clicks where electronic health records went wrong. I know we've both read this article. There's a lot of really eye-opening, interesting, kind of crazy things in the article that it highlights. And I want to go through a few of them and, and get your thoughts on them. So it says, calls out that the average time that a doctor spends with a patient is 11 minutes. I don't think that's anything eye-opening. It, everybody's touted it's 10 to 11 minutes. But what I think thought was kind of uh, wild was post the visit, doctor enters in 100 pieces of data on average for that 11-minute visit. So my question to you, you know, having been the doctor entering information in the HR and then what you're doing with the hospital now, what does that 100 pieces of data transmit into in time? Like how how much is the after work for that 100 pieces of data? What are you seeing? I think I think it's real. I think that hundred pieces of, of data that have to be entered over the course of the entire visit that that feels probably about right to me. Um, in in the hospital at the bedside, probably takes us twenty minutes per patient for an average hospital patient. Maybe thirty to fifty minutes for an ICU patient. But if you've ever been in the hospital, either for yourself or for a loved one, you'll know. Gee, I, di- I didn't see the doctor in the room for for twenty thirty minutes. What, right. You know what's going on. Uh, The doctors at the nursing station, it takes a lot of time for us to accumulate and look at all this data that's coming in, all the alarms, all the EKG monitors and the test results and everything that's coming back has to be synthesized. And so it takes us some time to pull it together, get our thoughts together, get a plan together, and then coordinate all that care. You got to talk to the respiratory therapist, the nurse, the pharmacist, the care coordinators, it's there's so much that goes on outside of that room and there's data that's being collected and clicked on and driven into that electronic health record to document that it was all done and so the patient may not see this as being high value care because they don't feel it they don't see it but it's definitely part of care today it probably always has been the the doctors though would they would spend less time on their note in the old days you could do your note on a 3 by 5 card or two to three sentences and you can't do that now now the regulatory requirements the government has put in place to get paid for your visit is to you know document a long list of things that have happened during that visit if you didn't document it didn't happen so, so, yes, there's a lot of clicks. There's a lot of time spent outside of the direct patient care, whether that's in the office or whether that's in the hospital. That That's real time. And the, I've seen the studies, and I believe it, that you're probably spending for every hour you're you know spending with the patient, you're probably an hour or two you know, behind the scenes making things happen. Uh, that's, so, that's a lot of time. And, so you know, I guess... They say it's not compensated. It's, you know, the government will say, well, we built that into the rate of, of uh, what you get when you see the patient. Right. Um, sure, I guess. Um, but, you know, for the provider who now has to do all this work, they're seeing that that's a Less lot of work patients, that they're doing yeah. outside of direct patient care. All right. So I feel bad that I'm always uh, complaining about how long the uh, doctor takes when I, my uh, dad or grandma, <laughs> I'm like, what on earth could could they be out there typing? They said the doctor was going to come in a half hour ago. Like, what on earth? Can they not type? So I feel bad now. <laughs> so, all right. Note to self, my ADD kicked in. I'm going to be a little bit nicer next time. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> we appreciate that. But, yeah, no, there is a lot of work that's done there. Yeah. And so then the other thing that it said specifically on ER docs is that in one shift, they have over 4,000 computer clicks. And so I'm, I was sitting there thinking when I was reading the article, okay, I'm the CEO of a tech company. I'm on a computer for you know, 12, 14 hours a day. I wonder how many clicks I make a day. I don't think it's 4,000, but that seems insane to me. Is that, is that an average for an ER doc? I think this can be true. It, it'll depend upon the doctor. Uh, some are using scribes now, which really works pretty well in the emergency department. The doctor will barely touch the keyboard. They'll enter some orders and, and you know, review some things, but um, 
They have someone doing most of the typing and clicking for them. I've seen others who are just clicking away. Some of the, some of my, I'll say older colleagues, but they're there typing every single keystroke themselves. They're probably doing more than 4,000 clicks a shift. Wow. I think it depends if the doctor took the time to optimize what they do in the EMR. It, there's these things that we have called macros with one click that'll generate, let's say, 20 or 30 data points, gotcha. um, fill in a bunch of buttons. If you've built those, that one click's going to save you a bunch. But if you haven't, then, and you're doing 4,000 clicks a shift, you have to own some of that. You created some of that. Right. So some of the doctors who are complaining of fatigue and burnout, uh, some of them are they're, they're almost a little too burned out to see the light at the end of the tunnel, and they're not willing to put the time in to make their lives better. And I think they do struggle. It's the optimization activities and learning it right the first time for the new providers that makes a huge difference. Yeah, and so let's talk about the process. And you mentioned the macros, and you've spent a lot of time at uh, Peninsula on really getting more efficiency out of your EMR. And, you know, whether that's through training the nurses, the doctors, through process improvements that you guys made, what are three things for you know, other organizations that are listening for that, you know, maybe that doctor that doesn't have the macros and is making all these clicks. What are some lessons learned that you guys came away with that really helped um, either technology or process wise kind of make that better? So we came out with this program, we call it the home for dinner program. And it's designed mm -hmm. to do just that. We want to get everyone home for dinner. Um, so they, they're not, they're charting it eight, nine o'clock at night, missing their family time. They call it pajama time. I think the first thing to do is to get that onboarding piece correct. You want to make sure that you're starting out on the right foot. And in healthcare, we don't always do this. We'll do a rushed four-hour session that leaves the provider overwhelmed and the trainer probably overwhelmed as well. And in other industries, it's more of a, a deep, multi-day indoctrination into the culture and the tools that, that they use so that you're really comfortable when you start sitting down to do your first day of work. In healthcare, sometimes it's just, um, you know, here's your training. Good luck. Here's my card. Call me if you need me, and, uh, you know, we'll see you on the floors or in the clinic. We don't really do um, – a checkup, kind of like, hey, did you just absorb all this information that we just put into you? Did you get any of that? And wouldn't you like it before someone orders some big procedure on you or a medication that someone has kind of checked them out and said, yeah, they know what they're doing. They're, they're good. Um, we don't really do that on a routine basis. So one of the things that Peninsula I am recommending that we do, and we've started doing this now, is let's just make sure that the provider's comfortable, that they really feel good. And that's that onboarding piece. For those who are already going, though, onboarding, well, we're beyond that now. It's we got to optimize them, and they need to make sure they're taking full advantage of the tool. This, these things can do so much. They are so powerful if you have the people in place and the provider's willingness to engage and take full advantage of it. The tool can, you know, it can pull in the last things that you want and use these fancy statements that says, hey, if the patient's on this medicine, then make sure this lab value pops into my note automatically. But that has to be programmed and trained to do that. It doesn't happen automatically. Right. I, I think those are the, the, you know, some of the main things. The, I think the piece that is also overlooked a lot is giving the providers a voice in how how many alerts they get, what kind of alerts do they get, um, how the screens look, the things that can be customized at the local level. And I think providers want some of that control back. So giving them that voice, that say in governance is another thing that I think makes providers feel a whole lot better about what they're doing and helps them engage in the process. Those are the top three things that I would do is onboarding, optimize, and get the governance right so the providers have a say. Yeah, though, that makes a lot of sense. And someone told me the other day from a physician standpoint, and I'd never really kind of thought about it is says, you know, we have all these initiatives out there from a technology standpoint to, you know, improve the patient experience, to improve administrator time, things like that. And said, really, when it boils down to new technologies in healthcare, one of the things that technology companies and administrators need to think about is how does it improve the physician experience? 
and not only the physician experience from a how does a physician make more money? How does a physician get more, as you said, more time in their pajamas or home with their family? <laughs> and so if you're an administrator or, you know, on the IT side or tech side, and let's say you don't have the big hospital budgets or whatever, and maybe you're a practice group with, you know, 20, 20 providers or something like that. How how do these folks, these administrators, put on kind of that physician hat and really think about the physician experience as it relates to not only the EHR, but new technologies to understand what are the really drivers that make that physician say, to your point, yeah, I'm going to stay an extra hour for this onboarding because, you know, I'm interested in, you know, seeing more patients to make more money or I'm interested in being home with my family. Um, how do administrators better understand that? physician experience and what's really driving them to with these new technologies? I don't think this is that much different than any other business or any other industry where you want to invest in your people. I think that's kind of throughout business that you want to make sure that your your most valuable asset is taken care of. Yeah. And that's people. And that people in this case is doctors and nurses. And you know, there's some who say, well, you know, there's an ROI that we're expecting to get when we just hired this very expensive doctor and we want them in the clinic on day one or in the operating room and they need to get to work right away so we can start to recover our costs. Yeah. And I think there's there's a – let's step back. Let's make sure that we're looking for the long-term benefit of the community for that provider. If that provider feels uncomfortable, makes a mistake, burns out – I think that the devastation that happens in that case, the provider leaves or quits medicine, that they're then looking at, you know, a loss of that asset to the business and to the community. I think there's a, a company out in, in California, Kaiser. Uh, they take their providers out of the clinic for three days, put them in a hotel off-site where they're not even allowed to look or think about patients. They put them in with a room full of trainers and analysts and for three days, they optimize and build the EHR to do exactly what the provider needs it to do. And when they did that, they're not thinking about an immediate return on investment at Kaiser. They're thinking about the long term, how expensive it is to have to replace one of these providers and how much better care and quality they get when the provider is comfortable with what they're doing. So, I mean, my advice is to, is number one, is to invest in the people. And then number two is to invest in the technology that's going to make healthcare easier. As this artificial intelligence tool starts to come into healthcare more and makes the mundane tasks easier, particularly for the providers and the nurses, there's no immediate return on investment in that tool. It's not like that MRI machine, which when, as soon as you get it, you turn it on, and you have patients going through it. Every time it clicks, there's, there's revenue being generated. Right. In this case, that's not, that's not going to be the way it works. There's something um, that's being built now called ambient clinical intelligence. It's a few years out, but what's going to happen is the computer will be in the exam room with you listening to the conversation and can tell, is that the doctor speaking or the patient speaking, and then build the note in the background. And when the doctor says, you know, uh, I think we ought to get an x-ray of that arm, well, the computer then goes and orders the x-ray of the arm. Those are the kind of tools that we're going to need to be successful in the future, and we've got to invest in that technology uh, as a clinic, as a hospital, to make sure our providers have what they need. Yeah, well, with with uh, the machine you're talking about in the uh, robotic surgeries, we may just uh, take out the uh, doctors altogether, right? <laughs> I don't think we're anywhere <laughs> near that. I think the the tools will definitely make life easier, better, yeah, hopefully faster, more you know, less errors. I, I don't quite see us being replaced by the no, machines no, quite no. yet. We're, we're good for a while. No, I think it's funny when there's all these, I mean, I think automation and intelligence is great, you know, and to definitely help out with mundane tasks and, and make the human's life, you know, easier and reduce error rates. Mm -hmm. I just find it funny when you read these articles, you know, regardless of industry, you know, everyone has an opinion like, oh, robots are good. And it's like, okay, whatever. <laughs> you know, it's like, yeah, yeah. I mean, that is kind of the perception that's out there. Yeah. Most of us who are seeing what's coming out of AI, out of these startups, really see the, the benefit in that the mundane, the, you know, when I'm, when I'm, ordering colonoscopies on patients. Well, they just hit 50 and every patient who's 50 and over needs a colonoscopy. 
do I need to think about that? Or can't the computer just do that for me? I'm just right. like, it's, it's, it's a no brainer. Let's it's just do it. <laughs> and so that kind of easy stuff, I think I could see the computer starting to lift off of my shoulders. Let me think about the complicated patient with respiratory mm-hmm. and heart and cancer problems that need that unique thought process right. to help, not right. the routine. Right. So one of the things you said earlier about, you know, the what Kaiser's doing, and obviously, you know, Kaiser's now seeing seventy percent of their patients, you know, through telehealth. So they're innovators, and in, I think like every asset. But one of the things that you said about, you know, if the EHR is not set up properly, you know, they're going to make mistakes and things like that. Or if you're not trained and you just throw somebody in because you want to get that revenue. The article also references, you know, how deadly these patient errors can be, right? And so without getting into all the legalities and everything of that, you know, I think it was kind of eye opening for me because I hadn't thought about, you know, okay, somebody's making 4,000, take the healthcare industry out of it, right? You said have somebody making 4,000 clicks a day, there's going to be errors, right? Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. It, it happens to be in healthcare, but any industry, if somebody's doing that, and there's going to be fatigue, there's going to be just misclicks, whatever. Um, so, is the the patient errors that they reference in the article that you know could lead to be you know deadly things or you know life threatening things, whatever? I mean, I'm guessing that's just a sheer numbers, right? I mean, I'm, I'm guessing there's more light shined on to as we're talking about EHR, but when doctors were paper charting, it, it, I'm sure there were errors in paper charting, right? A nurse read it wrong. Absolutely, there was a missing Absolutely. sheet of paper. Absolutely. So we, we could pick up the wrong paper chart and put the order in, and the and and in the article they talk about someone ordering in the wrong electronic chart. That still happened on paper. It's just right. we didn't talk about it as much, but it definitely still happened. Um, so I think the EHR. Definitely has the potential to add error. There, there's there's interface. You know the the when you you're looking at the screen and gee, shouldn't this piece of information be right here in front of me and called out and screaming at me? Instead, it's buried down in the corner. Those kinds of things definitely could be enhanced. There's uh, code that could be done that that would make it less likely for these errors to take place. And I think that that's constantly being worked on. Reducing the number of clicks, yes, that is definitely important when you are doing thousands and thousands of clicks. Eventually, one of them is going to be wrong. a click in the wrong place, or you're just you're on autopilot. You're just clicking away, and and you don't you don't pay attention to that warning that comes up. And I think that's one of my colleagues had this great quote: is that the number of alerts that we get is does it make us any safer? Safer? Does an infinite number of alerts? make you infinitely safer? Yeah. And the answer is no. So you're constantly clicking through these alerts saying, go away, go away, go away. Oh, wait, there was an important one and I missed it. Right. And that's where these EHRs can get us in trouble is they over alert us or uh, they, they, they put things in a funny place. They bury information deep into the chart where you'll never see it or never think about going because it's not intuitive to go there. And that is a problem. That, that, there's some truth in that article for sure that the EHR can add to error. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Well, the last question that I want to talk about is as we look out to the future of healthcare, and as we talk about, you know, more of the digital patient experience with folks with the artificial intelligence, remote monitoring, you know, video telehealth, and as we have more and more millennials um, and even Gen Z's coming into being patients who don't have a primary care physician because you know, they're more comfortable, you know, walking into a retail clinic or doing a telehealth um, appointment. How does the EHR fit in this? Does it help this kind of value of care and proactive care with some of the technology enablers? Does it make it more complex? You know, how does that work in the future? It it definitely helps. It it's a piece of the puzzle, but it's. It's going to look different than it does today. Today, uh, arguably, the EHR is a tool for the doctor, uh, the whole care team, of course. But 
it's not so much the patient's tool. The patient has very little insight into what goes into their health record. They have a hard time actually getting access to what's in their health record. And sure, you could go to the hospital and say, I'd like a copy of my record, and we'll print out all 20,000 pages for you, and good luck making sense of it. Right. We, we really don't have that nice unified view. Now, that will change. I think the Gen Zs, they're going to drive some of this. The millennials, as they're getting their care and, and let's say an urgent care center, that data that's sitting out there in that silo doesn't do any good for them. That data has to come together into a centralized place. That's going to be the EHR. And so the EHR will be where all this data gets aggregated. Sure, you've got a Fitbit or an Apple Watch that's watching every bowel movement you ever had and, and recording that. And that data has to go somewhere. And we've got to aggregate that and then someone's got to make sense of it. It has to fit into the clinical context. Right. That's going to happen in the HR. But the patients who are going to get the best care are the ones who are actively engaged in managing their own health data, making sure what's in there is accurate, making sure that they're picking up on the trends that are happening, asking for guidance from their healthcare team as it makes sense, depending upon what the data is saying, and being able to make sure that data from whatever organizations they go to is coming to their EHR of choice and that the patient owns that data. That's going to look very different than it does today, but that's not going to be too far away. I think that will happen within the next five years. Well, that's awesome. Well, Dr. Wiseman, it has been so great to have you on the show. Lots of great insights on this topic. I really appreciate you coming on the show Remember to, if you have any questions for myself or Dr. Wiseman from this podcast, feel free to leave those. Subscribe to the show, and uh, we will see you next week. Thank, Dr. Wiseman, thank you so much for being on the show. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. This podcast has come to a close. To hear more from the Executive Innovation Show podcast, subscribe, submit questions, and share the love. Follow us on social. We're everywhere.